Kia ora. Hi everyone. Due to circumstances beyond my control, I've been unable to get this week's episode edited in time for today. So instead, I'm replaying one of my scarier interviews with a family that was tormented by an evil entity for many years and which ultimately led to the deaths of two family members. This originally aired in May 2021 in the earlier seasons of our podcast and was called Belly of the Beast. We should be back on track next episode. In the meantime, ka kite. Kia ora, koutou, no mai, haere mai. Hello everyone, welcome to the Walk in the Shadowlands podcast. Join me as we take a walk into the realms of the unexplained, of the paranormal, of things that go bump in the night and haunt your dreams. Your hosts? I'm Marianne. Thanks so much for joining me. Today, tonight, whatever time it is, wherever you live in this beautiful world of ours, sit back and relax. Let me be your guide as we walk into the Shadowlands together and see what awaits us there. Hello everyone and welcome to Season 7 of the Walk in the Shadowlands podcast. For those of you who've been following my social media posts on TikTok, Twitter, Instagram and my Facebook page, you already have an idea of what this episode is all about. But before I get into that, I just want to say how wonderful it is to be back with you all. It's been an absolute struggle for me to get this episode edited, stitched together and transcribed for you all. In case you're a first-time listener, I had an accident some weeks ago and I broke my arm in two places, at my wrist and at my elbow. Plus, I tore the rotator cuff in my shoulder of the same arm. But hey, if you're going to do something, then do. Good job of it, right? So it's taken me around six weeks to edit this episode for you all. Typing with one hand and editing audio is tricky. But here we finally are. So thank you all for your patience and kind wishes. I'm doing fine now and beginning to type with two hands. I'm having physical therapy at my local hospital to regain flexion in that arm and doing really well. But that's enough of me. For the next two episodes... I have some very special guests who have been so patient and understanding with me. I actually interviewed them before Christmas, but due to all sorts of circumstances, not only my accident, I haven't been able to air their episodes until now. And it's in two parts, because I interviewed all surviving members of this family, except for one brother, and that really was all about timing and availability, not because he didn't want to talk. In this first episode, I talk with author and playwright Sean Paul Murphy, who was my initial contact because of his book Chapel Street, and the real-life haunting experiences that prompted the writing of his fictional account of them. It was he who suggested his family might be interested in also sharing their experiences as well, and that is how this two-part episode came about. This family's experiences living in an actively haunted home were both in parts terrifying and tragic as two family members died, perhaps as a result of what they experienced in the hauntings compounded with other personal issues they were experiencing, a brother and a sister. And here is a trigger warning for some of you. During our conversations, we will talk about the suicides of Laura and Mark and how the family feels the hauntings and terrors they experienced in the house, at least in part, possibly led to their deaths. These experiences are so traumatising to the family that all these years later, some of them are still dealing with the residual fear and trauma from the hauntings in the home. As I said previously, I spoke with all surviving family members, 
barring the other brother. However, because of the trauma and fear left behind, Sean's sister and her daughter agreed to talk with me and allowed me to use their words, but they themselves did not want to be in the show. I fully and absolutely respect their wishes, so their recollections are voiced by myself, identifying who is speaking. You might want to leave the lights on for these episodes. And without any further ado, are you willing to walk with me into this part of the Shadowlands? Let's begin. Please tell my audience, particularly for those in the Southern Hemisphere where I live, who may not have heard of you and what you do, a little bit about your background and how. Okay, well, my name is Sean Paul Murphy. I am a writer, an editor, and a producer. And um, I've um, written 14 produced feature films, mainly in the faith based um, genre. Um, I've written two books. Um, the first was a memoir called The Promise or the Pros and Cons of Talking with God, and which was published by Touchpoint Press in, I think, 2016, maybe, or, two, you know, I can't remember the year. And I recently put out a, a, a horror novel called um, Chapel Street, and that's the story of a young man battling a demonic entity that has driven members of his family to suicide for generations. And um, although the book is fictional, it was inspired by actual events that my family um, that my family experienced. Um, in fact, the book was actually inspired by my very mother. Um, we grew, you know, we moved into a um, an actively. Um, I, I hate to use the word haunted because that always says ghost, but we were in, probably in what it was a demonically possessed house in 1974 when I was very young, and our family maintained ownership of the house until about 2016. And over that time, there was a, a lot of activity, and two of my siblings uh, took their own lives, and other members of my family attempted and or had events that would have been misconstrued as suicide if they had played out to their conclusion. And um, uh, about two mm. years ago, I guess it was, my mother asked me if I thought that the entity in the house was responsible, at least in part, for the death of my my sister Laurie and my brother Mark. And I wrote Chapel Street um, to sort of um, examine that question myself, because it's something I think it's uh, it's something I had always considered, and I think it's something that other people in the family had considered as well. So my mother inspired the book and. And it's funny because our family never discussed the haunting, essentially, except for a very brief period when it was very active in the um, mid to late 80s. And um, we never discussed it for a couple reasons. Maybe you can ask me why later. But, you know, after um, after I wrote the rough draft of my book, um, I gave it to my young, my surviving sister. I had um, three brothers and two sisters and uh, she read it. And she she thought she called me over and said she thought the book was a cartoon version of the actual events, and she didn't mean that in a derogatory way. What she meant was mm -hmm. that it was it was our actual events, but highly exaggerated. At the end, the book is really exaggerated. Nothing like that really happened, but most of the stuff that happened in the book right. was based on something, and the people were based on real people. And um, that's when my sister, who never really wanted to discuss it said we should start having family meetings to discuss the actual haunting because, you know, it's, you know, we've been out of the house for 16 years and it was about time that we actually discussed it. And um, I started doing a series of interviews with my siblings. It's, I'm 23 blogs into it on my blog, you know, seanpaulmurphyville.blogspot.com. It's mainly interviews with people who had experienced the haunting. and. It's really, the blogs are intended to be a three-part series. The first part is about the actual the history of the house, the actual haunting itself. The second part is going to deal with my the deaths of my siblings. And the third part is going to be like analysis. And I'm hoping to get like some expert opinions 
like from, I'm hoping to get like religious people with experience in exorcism and demonic possession to hauntings, secular like paranormal investigators to um, look at an, an answer. Mm -hmm. was, was, was this entity responsible? And, it's, and I know we didn't do the right things with it. Wouldn't you say that's true, Mother? I don't think, yeah. Correct. And it's sort of like, what? I don't think we were knowledgeable enough. I think um, at this point in time, uh, it would had it happened now, I think we would have been more knowledgeable of what kind of help mm -hmm. we could have mm -hmm. seeked. And we just were on a, I guess, <laughs> wasn't as popular back then or spoken about. Yeah, it. so essentially I'm trying to do, it's like mm -hmm. a um, best case, um, you know, best practices type of thing. It's like, if you find yourself in the same yeah. position we're in, don't do what we did. In fact, a number of people ask me, am I planning mm -hmm. to write a book about the actual haunting? Yeah. And I always say, I don't think I am because I don't like how it ended. I like books with a happy ending. In the end, two of us are dead and we just ran away. <laughs> so, you know, it isn't like, it's hard to paint what we had as a win, you know, in our experiences. Yeah, yeah. Right. Before we go any further, Clara, I'd like to say more to both you, but Clara, as a mum, I just cannot begin to imagine the pain of losing two children and losing two children in that yeah. manner. So I, I'm so very, very sorry you. for your loss. Mm -hmm. Very, yeah, very sorry. It's a small club that I belong to. Yeah, and and I can see, I can see that that pain is still there, and it, it's a pain that will never go away. I know, I know. Yeah. In their physical form, we miss being here with yeah. us, but I think they are in a good place, and I think they keep an eye on us. And oh, know. absolutely, absolutely. I can. I, oh gosh, I should put some tissues in. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Yes, I really don't. Although I'm sad about it, I don't have a problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I totally understand that. Yeah. So let's go back to when you first saw the house, Clara. When you first when you first moved into this house, when you first saw this house, did you have any feelings about it? Because you're quite a sensitive woman, and you do get strong intuitive feelings. Did this? Did it feel uncomfortable or out of place or anything like that? No, it was very dark inside. Mm. The outside of the house was absolutely beautiful. I remember. I was very active in uh, the church and in the school, and one of the women who was, um, I was like the lunch mother, you know, right. one of the other lunch mothers said, oh, there's a house. For we had to move from the house that we were in. My mother and my stepfather owned that house, and they wanted to sell the house. So right. we, we were told we should, you know, had to be out. So... One of the women said to me, oh, there's a house on my street that the woman just died and they're going to sell the house. And when I saw the house, I was like, oh, it was just a beautiful house. It was unlike any other house in all that area. Mm -hmm. you know, it, was, it was just gorgeous. It had um, big oak trees around it. It had a large front porch that went around on the side. It had... Um, it was just gorgeous. It had the oak trees down to one side, and it had a holly tree that was four stories tall on the other side. It had a lot of land. It was it was just a gorgeous house, and it was very dark in inside. Though there, it was like there wasn't a lot. There was never a lot of light in it, especially mm -hmm. on the first floor. It was always dark, but I did not have any bad feeling about it. Um, I don't know. I guess I just wasn't sensitive to it. In fact, I've always loved that house. I even hated the, even with all that went on, I hated to leave it. The mm -hmm. house itself, you know. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So maybe, Clara, we could start to talk about the experiences in your house when you first got the house, because this really started with you, didn't it? Yes, it did. <laughs> Actually, I don't know if it started with me. No, I don't know. What I mean is um, 
the first, my daughter, Laura, the one who committed suicide, I remember right after we moved in there, she was out in the backyard and the house in the back was almost three stories out of wow. the ground. So the second story, that was the basement, the first story, the second story had a um, sun porch. And she came in and said, there was a lady on the sun porch. And so I think she was, I said, oh, that was probably the woman who passed away in the house before we, we got it. It was an estate sale. Uh, her name was Mayford. I said, oh, that was probably Mrs. Mayford. And so um, I assumed that, Miss, see, I've always had some psychic ability, let me yes. say. And I've always believed in spirits and mm -hmm. such. And so I just assumed that Mrs. Mayfield was there to check us out. After all, we were in mm -hmm. her house. You know, so I think she was probably the first one that mentioned it. And after that, there were little things it fooled with mm -hmm. us, but there were different things that um, would occur. And at first you didn't really know what was mm -hmm. happening because a lot of it was very mm -hmm. subtle. And I remember my daughter, Jeannie, who at the time, how old was Jeannie, Sean? She was probably nine. Yeah, about nine years old, I would guess, when she moved in. Jeannie. So when we moved into the house, I was nine years old. When we saw this house, it was spectacular. I mean, I couldn't believe we were moving into this house, this beautiful stained glass that had a double staircase. It was like what we had moved from a tiny little place. And my sister and I, since at the old house we were in what was pretty much a closet, didn't even have a door on it. We got the big room and it had like what we called the sun porch off of it. And it was really like super cool until, well, I guess from the beginning. I don't know if everyone did, but I certainly felt kind of immediately that the closet that my sister and I had, it was a big, long closet. It's like when you open the door, it also went in deep that way with a rack hanging all the way across it. It never felt good. It was always like it was too black. Like, how could it be that dark? And the other thing about it, which was really cool at first, was that it had evidently been another room, so that between my room and the bathroom, which was behind us, there was even a window in the middle, like they had put a wall down in the middle of the window, so it had been one. And there, there was also a linen closet that you got to through the hallway that was probably all that one room. So at first we thought it was kind of cool because you could peek through the window, peek through the window like in here, people in the bathroom, you know, when you're nine years old. And if you went out onto the sun porch, if you opened up the shutters, it was an actual window. You could see both closets. And if you opened the door to go out into the hallway, that like it would be really super cold. And it would be, and the bathroom was right across to you, but it would almost but it would be almost like it was all of these different conversations going on that you couldn't quite hear. That was just like so much going on and it was so cold. She had a, well, I don't know, if one, one of the girls had a party and there were a bunch of girls over. And my daughter, Laura, said, Mom, Mom, you have to come upstairs and see this. And uh, it was up in their bedroom. They shared a bedroom. And... Um, the girls would take their, fing their fingers and go like this. And Jeannie actually raised up. I mean, she, they weren't touching her. She raised up off the floor. And it really scared the heck out of me. And I thought, this isn't, this isn't normal. Were they doing that light as a feather thing? Or were they actually touching her and she was they raising up? They were not up? touching her. They were not touching her? No. Jeannie. Then I kind of became a hit with the middle school set because at all the pyjama parties, I could do levitation. I could make things disappear. I sort of felt like, you know, middle school girls with pyjama parties, they're all having seances or looking in the mirror and people would like, I don't know what they saw, but I'd be like playing the lawn and feeling like 
feeling my neck, feeling my groove here. And they were just like there screaming that they were seeing things in the mirror, like that kind of thing. It would, they started as light as a feather. Right. But then they weren't touching it. Wow. That must have been absolutely terrifying for you to it see It was that. for me. Not, yeah. I said, don't ever do that again. You know, I, I was shaken by it. I mean, I had never seen anything yeah. like that. It was pretty scary. Like one thing, right. you could never keep light bulbs in that house. Uh, you could change your light bulb and right. the next week it would be out. You know, there was a lot of um, things that happened. I had a vanity table in my bedroom and I always kept my hairbrush there. You could brush your hair, put the hairbrush, you know, I would go to bed, get up in the morning, go to brush my hair. My hairbrush right. would be gone. That was me. Yeah. <laughs> Just kidding, it wasn't me. <laughs> well, you look like you could use one. And uh, it would be gone. You could look everywhere and it would be gone for days. Mm -hmm. Your earrings or your watch, different things, they would just completely vanish. And then at some point in time, they would show right back up where you had left them. And there was a very, there was so much that went on in that house. I think Jean actually had the first, she had a very, from the very beginning, a very intense experience with it, like communicating mm -hmm. with her, sort of like, offering her like psychic powers, mm. you know. Jeannie, the thing in the closet, I felt like it was targeting me and it like wanted to be my friend and it was horrifying. But it it also to me, like it had like the mind game. So I was feeling like I became super psychic. You know what I mean? Like there was some other higher thing there. And what was interesting is that during the day, you would completely forget about it, right? But then, like, at night when it was happening, and you'd be like, oh, my God, yes, I remember this. How could I forget this? I think I was having conversations with it. It was like, I think that it was like I was a vulnerable youth, and I think it kind of, like, made me feel like I was special and had special gifts. It was One thing that really surprised me. I've heard my mother's stories about, you know, like seeing, you know, her bill, you know, her psychic things when she, she would talk about things in her youth and all. But what I didn't realize is that, you know, Jeannie, you know, it seems to be like down the maternal line. Jeannie had a lot of experiences. Her daughter, Marion, mm -hmm. had a lot of experience. Natalie, it seems like the females mm -hmm. in our family mm -hmm. all had very intense mm -hmm. experiences. And my niece, Marion, who didn't live in the house, feels that she was offered the same kind of deal that the entity offered her mm -hmm. mother. You know, it's mm -hmm. sort of like, do you like, do you like what you could do now, what you can learn, what you can experience? You know, there can be a lot mm -hmm. more, Very you know. Marion, I had a similar thing, an external like, do you want more? That sort of thing. Jeannie. Yeah, it was like that too, how you said it. Do you want more? And, you know, so um, so among, amongst the women, there was a lot, there was a lot of um, this kind of psychic activity. I will say that I did not experience it, knowingly experience anything in that house until the escalation, right. you know. And I say it's an escalation, but other people were experiencing things right from the beginning but at, there was this incident and um and as i've also in my research discovered there was an incident where my mother and a friend of hers wanted to communicate her friend ted wanted to communicate with one of ted's deceased aunts on a ouija board and brought it into our house and at that time the front the front third floor bedroom across the hall from me was an empty room and it was a quiet room. So they decided to um, have, you know, a um, Ouija board session mm -hmm. in there. And after that Ouija board session, whatever was happening in that house was mm -hmm. amped up 100%. Mm -hmm. and the thing is, Jeannie, I've heard from some of her friends, used to do Ouija board things at some of her, um, 
you know, her sleepovers mm-hmm. and all. So you weren't the um, you weren't the first uh, person. And she always blamed me for having the Ouija board in the house, and I didn't, didn't know until Sean started interview that Jeannie actually had the Ouija board. I think it was there mm. from the very beginning when we were there. I know it was there. From the, I think the more I thought about it from the very, from us first moving in. Right. And the, another thing with Sean, I remember asking him at some point when he was still living in the house, if he was having any experiences. And he was like, no. You know, I don't know what you're talking about. Right. You know, um, right. When it until until it, it seemed it came to a point. Well, I had it mm-hmm. cast out of the house a couple of times, and every time it came back, it came back more. It was mm-hmm. a strange, a strange experience in that it seemed like it wasn't always there. It seemed like. The house would be nice and calm mm. for a while, mm. and then it'd be one thing after another, after another, you know. Uh, and then it would go away. And I think pretty much that whole area had some kind of um, ex- other houses in that neighborhood mm. had experiences also. So I remember one time the, the, fe- the little kid that lived next door came over and was wow. in my son John, my youngest son's bedroom, when a black thing walked across the mirror and the boy next door said, oh, so you have it too? Yeah, apparently the mother of, um, I, it, it probably was longer than any of that, but apparently I heard that the mother of the boy next door, her mother was uh, like into witchcraft right. and we, you know, Ouija board stuff too. Right. And, uh, what I've, I've been learning because as um as i've been publishing these blogs people in the neighborhood who um mm. live near us were rel- telling us mm. stories about it happened at other houses or places it definitely seems in my opinion whatever lived in our house lived in at least the four other house lived up to four other houses to the top of the hill we lived in it seemed like i i'm just guessing it was definitely in the one next to us but i also believe it was in the next two right. And just, just to clarify a little bit, and this may be why I didn't experience anything initially, was at first, on the second floor of our house, there are three bedrooms and a bathroom on the second floor of the house on St. Helens Avenue. There are three, and the master bedroom goes out to the sun porch where my sister first saw whatever she saw. And there's, there, were, there are closets. There are three closets. One's a linen closet you could enter from the hallway. Mm -hmm. And then there's a closet from the master bedroom and a closet from the bathroom. And these closets were all joined. But if you actually look at the room and you look at how the closet was assembled, that was once a room and not three closets. It was once a small room. Now, it even had a window window to the outside. In a closet and then put a wall down the middle of the window. But that... Mm -hmm. So there was definitely a room there. Now, what, and this is another thing I've learned through the interviews. There seemed to be an entity that lived in that closet. Yes. And that would usually materialize. And a lot of people who have seen it, it seemed it was it was active and malevolent, but it, it would normally appear as a black shape. Right, a shadow person. You know, like darker than dark mm-hmm. shape. Sometimes it would have red eyes, sometimes it mm-hmm. wouldn't. But it would also materialize. Other people would see it as a, some of the same people saw it as a shape would also see it mm-hmm. as a shadow mm-hmm. figure, like a shadow man. Jeannie, so the first thing that happened to me, well, the mind games, but the first thing I saw, I was lying in my bed and the closet was to my left and the door into the hallway was over that way. Well, coming up from the door in the hallway, I could see it come and it rocked and rose. And then it just like, it looks like a big black cloak you see in the movies. They have Dracula with cloak. That's what it looks like. So I felt that come over me and then just like very close to me. And it was just, it was black. And I remember being like petrified. It was darker. It was darker than yes, dark. Yes, yeah. It was just so solid black, and it was enormous. 
It was tall. It was tall. It was right. right. Shadow people are uh, actually not that uncommon. I've seen one myself. And at my very first episode of the podcast was on shadow people. So if you, if you want to go and listen to that, Claire, it talks about that. And they are blacker than black. Yes. They are blacker than black. You can see them in the darkest room. They're so we black. played musical bedrooms a lot in that house. Uh, when we first moved in, the master bedroom, actually, Sean's right. calling that the master bedroom. Because it was the largest bedroom in the house. My right. daughters both shared that room as children, you know. And I, right. my husband and I actually had the smallest bedroom, which was in the front of the house. Well, that one had the least activity. Oh. No, it did have, there was, that was not a comfortable room either. There were certain rooms that... <laughs> Actually, none of the rooms in the house when you got down to it. The house was a beautiful little house. I think um, Tom was talking about the sensitivity of the women, too, but, um, yeah. I was struck by lightning when I was when I was little, and I think that's when I got... Um, really? Yes. Wow. Well, that's right. I remember reading that in the blog. You had a ring on, didn't you? Yes, yes. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Well, wow. that was you were very, very fortunate. But anyway, you can't like. I guess. I guess as a mum, as mums, we tend to blame ourselves for things that we actually don't have any control over. So, and and, and as a mum, you would have been really busy in the house with the kids, so you would have missed right. things. Well, I think. Me, but, I yeah. think a lot of that is, you know, there were. Um, well, I had six children. Of course, the youngest one was just a baby. Well, I got yeah. pregnant when we moved into the house. But, um, you know, and the front door was never locked. And the kids all had friends. And there were just so many people in the house at any given time that right. you heard strange noises or whatever. You just, well, it, somebody it was upstairs or, or it must be yeah. somebody in the other room, you know. Um, and it really, I think, didn't become apparent to me right away. you questioned yourself in the beginning of right did i really see that you know mm. something out of the corner of your eye the dog would watch something go by you know and yeah it just started getting to be more and more and it started to get yeah not to be nice mm. you know uh as Trump was talking about the closet upstairs um it was all that you would go in the bathroom and it always felt like something was watching. Everybody says that. From that right. closet. Even guests. You, everybody, mm. yes. Mm. You would be in there um, and the closet door would open. Right. And there was no reason for that door to open. The door had a doorknob, you know. Lock. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, my, uh, the bedroom closet, the closet in the bedroom. You could never keep that door closed. Right. Like during the night, you would hear it click open, and that's when the black thing would come out, you know. Um, uh, Jeannie, I would. I would see it frequently. And the thing is, like, it was almost like every time I felt like I would forget it, like, I would block it out, yeah, and then like suddenly I find myself like alone in my room at night and I'd be like, oh my God, it's here. I mean, and then it was like all through the house, I mean, the house during the day with the light, it was so lovely. But I remember so much of my youth being like, there had been like so many like shadows in the house. And if you were, if I was upstairs on my own, I would always turn the music on. I'd be dancing to try to forget it. Marion, my experience with the house usually was more psychological in terms of, well, I would, I mean, I would hear things like I constantly hear the furniture moving upstairs or people walk around. It's just like always constantly, constant in the background, like constantly kind of hearing like talking and that kind of stuff. But then it was drafty and you always kind of felt like it was all the shadows were, I don't know. When I was really little, the place wasn't that bad. 
It was just once I got older is when it started getting taking on creepiness to it because like we would go over there a lot but like me and Natalie would be playing and hanging out on the landing and stuff like that but then it kind of like turned when I got older that it got creepier like you kind of look in the mirror from the landing and I don't know just something kind of off about it. Now, Mother, did that black thing ever get into the bed with you? Something would get into the bed with me. I don't know if it was that thing or not. So, see, it used to do different things to different people. Mm, right, of it, course. It, mm. Like, it shows the women that I, I think it became more physical with. Right. Than it did with a lot of them, than it did with the men. But you could be in bed and you would feel something sit have you ever like been in bed and like your husband or whoever comes and sits on the bed you've right. that mattress move yes that happened just about every night uh sometimes it would hold you down in the bed you couldn't scream you couldn't move you were like paralyzed oh. and my son john experienced that we discussed that my son john and i um of course john at that time was a teenager so i mean it was and he wasn't even born when we moved into that house. So, I mean, it was a long while between, mm. you know, before we actually started discussing stuff like that. Yeah, I, I, I do want to say that um, I tracked all the owners, everybody who lived in that house. And um, my brother, John, was the first infant in the, in the house. The first family that lived there from 1915 to like 1927. When they moved in, they had an 11-year-old child. Right. The family that moved in in 1927 that had it until 1974 when we got it, they were all adults. It was um, it was a husband and, uh, uh, you know, I would say the mother, but she's a stepmother, but she was the sister of the, um, the children's. She was the aunt of the children who became the stepmother. Right. Two boys and a girl. And um, they said there were no children in that house. I was curious if that small room was intended to be a nursery. Mm -hmm. My mother doesn't think so, but I think maybe it was but um you know so but i'll tell you one of the reasons i decided to write the blogs was at this meeting my sister had she brought my brother john over and john tells this story in one of the interviews but he added something at the end of what he when he told it to me in person first that he is that he was up in the room where the ouija board incident was which we started calling either the hell room or the hell hole, right. you know, and, you know, when you start calling a room, the hell room, there's usually, yeah, a good reason. Reason. Mm -hmm. the hell room. but he was up there and there was this window in the middle of the room and there were these mirrors and there were pictures hanging on it. He said he was looking at the pictures and something came up behind him. He didn't see it literally picked him up and threw him against the wall, lifted him off the ground wow. and threw him against the wall. And he said, had I been a few inches over, I would have gone right through that window. And he goes, and everybody would have thought it was suicide because I was at the age when people kill themselves. So um, that was when the that's when it made me think, that's what made me think really tie in mm -hmm. with my brother and my sister. Mm -hmm. Jeannie had a suicide event. I don't, and um, you know, I don't, you know, maybe I'm jumping ahead, but um, I had this in Chapel Street, the hero of the, of the book, finds himself out on his balcony every night ready to jump off the 10-story balcony. You know, he's like having these, um, because of um, some visions he's having, he doesn't realize he's out there. Mm -hmm. But um, I don't know what year, I probably, if I had my notes, because the thing is, when, when we did this, none, nobody was writing anything. Right, there. of course. So mm -hmm. it, it took a long time mm -hmm. to build what I call the master timeline mm -hmm. of like the events. And in the recap, the events were kind of in the right order. Mm. But when it got really bad with me, you know, after after the Ouija board event, you know, the height of it for me was I woke up from, I can't tell you for sure whether it was three nights in a row or five nights in a row, but I woke up crawling out of this third story back window of the house. Now there was like a slightly flat roof on the sun porch out there. But the drop off of our hat back of our house was very, very steep. steep. Mm -hmm. It was probably closer to four stories. Yes, and there was some a patio and like a metal stairs down from the porch there. So falling off that roof would have almost definitely been fatal. Wow. For three nights in a row, I, I woke up literally climbing out because my knee would hit the 
the wood, you know, yep. window frame or my head would hit the top mm -hmm. of the window. Mm -hmm. And it must have been, you know, it must have been the summer or spring because the windows were open. Mm -hmm. And when I would wake up, it was three o'clock in the morning. Wow. And, you know, and that's why I knew how I knew this wasn't sleepwalking because mm -hmm. it happened at the same time of the night, mm -hmm. you know, and that was the culmination of a lot of small events. But at that point, I realized that whatever it was in this house wanted me to die mm. and wanted to kill me mm. or wanted me to kill myself. I had a similar and, incident you know, also. Um, I was driving across, um, I don't know if you're familiar with the Chesapeake Bay. There's Chesapeake Bay Bridge. It's three miles long. And I was in my car by myself. And I was going to the from the western shore to the eastern shore. And all of a sudden, I had no brakes. Yeah. Mm. And um, I could not stop the car, I, you know. Uh, I finally got, by the time I got off the, I was really afraid. There was nothing I could do. I didn't know what to do. And I got, I actually went to a gas station. Once I got off the bridge, it seemed like my brakes came back. And I stopped at a, um, um, yeah, service station and said, would you please check my brakes? I just, I had no brakes on the bridge. And they're like, he checked them and I said, honey, your brakes are fine. But I had, I mean, my foot went down to the floor with the brake. There was no, no brake, wow. which has that, was this I after I looked died? like a suicide also, you know? Yeah. yeah. So I think we all have- Was this after Laurie died or before Laurie died? That was before Laurie died. It was around that time, it was around that time. And this entity would follow. Mm -hmm. That was one of the reasons we didn't talk about it, because we felt if you talked about it yeah, and people had the experience, if they talked about it, it would show up. Right. You know, that's one of the reasons why even after we left the house, we you know didn't talk about it. You know, I, but, um, I, I think the scariest room in the house was indeed the hellhole. Um, there were two closets up there that... Um, they were basically, one was like a crawl space. That was another place you couldn't keep that door closed either. Doors in that house would not stay closed. Um, mm. And then there was a closet that, it was short, like I'm short, I'm, I'm 4'11". I could mm. walk in it, but nobody else could. For a while I had my sewing room up there and it was very scary. For a while even I slept up there. Um, and briefly, very briefly, because some of the horrible things happened to me in that room. Um, when my bed was there, there was uh, um, the small closet, the closet that I could walk into was at the foot of my bed. All right. And this ball of fire came out of it. And it made a whoosh, 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 and it was a ball of fire, and it just kept going faster and faster, and it came <laughs> right at me. Well, I ran, I ran out of there screaming, and then another night, it was a cat. It was this big black cat that was standing on me going, <sighs> like that, and I, I, Sean was sleeping in the other room, and he, I'm screaming. When you went in that room, it was like going into, it was like there was no sound penetrated it. I, but right. I, I was so bad. I, I had a pillow in my hand, clutching the pillow, running out of there. And I still had in my hand indentations from my fingernails because I was clutching my hand so bad. And I was like, Sean, did you hear, did you hear me scream? Uh. He was like, you were screaming? <laughs> Yeah. Now, the entity in the house, you know, I came into this, you know, interviews with a certain perspective based on my theological understanding. And I decided to take the blinders mm. off and just take everything as people are saying and not trying to put it in a box. But one thing I would have said when I lived there, that it was just one entity in the house. Mm. However, as a result of these interviews, it seemed like there were at least two distinct creatures in the house. The one was mm -hmm. this one that took you normally know, took the form of the shadow person on the second floor. Right. And that was malevolent. But the other one, 
that lived that seemed to live in the stand up closet on the third floor in their hell room manifested itself in entirely different ways. Like this cat like creature my mother saw, my sister saw that event, you know, right, mm -hmm. right near the beginning too. And uh, that's why her and her husband <laughs> left the house. You know, they were there, you know, they moved down to the second floor for a little while, but they left because they saw a cat like, you know, creature with red eyes. I never knew I'm that. out of that I never closet. Knew that. Jeannie, yeah, I was 20, 21 when my husband, Marion's father, and I were up then in the upper room in what we affectionately call the hellhole, the house, right? And we were sleeping in the bed, and we literally, we literally saw a black, like leopard like cat that had red eyes and it came out of a closet and literally came up to us and I knew it wanted my baby and we ran the hell out of it. The thing on the second floor never materialized in that way. So that's why it right. makes me think that there were there were at least two entities in the house. Because the one upstairs, as malevolent as the one on the first floor on the second floor was, the one on the third floor was vicious. Like that's the one that picked yeah. my brother up and threw him against the wall. That's the one that was right. driving me out onto the out of my window in the middle of the night. You know, and and my mother said earlier that sometimes it would seem like it would disappear. I'm not sure it ever did. But because it what it seemed to, particularly at the height, it would bother one person a night. You know, and you could usually tell who it was because they would be sleeping in the living room on the first floor, you know, in the next morning because they would be driven. It seemed content to drive you out of this bedroom. But rarely were there events that were witnessed by multiple people at the same time because this thing seemed intent somehow on, I think, A, bringing like a spirit of darkness and depression on us, but also isolating us, you know, because it seemed like it... it it would attack one of us, and since no one else would ever hear it or, you know, see it, or, right. like, is this just me? You know, it was only right. how this thing happened, approached my sister, the cat-like creature on the third floor, that, that she finally came down and said, there's something seriously wrong in this house. There is something in this house. Right. You know, and she was pregnant uh, at the time, and she didn't want to bring up her, she didn't want to have a baby in right. that house, so she left. Jeannie, so, you know, I had that. I was very, I was very glad when I moved out. But I found that the psychic things continued very much, and now actually, I'm pretty afraid of it. I associated with the evil thing that was in the house, and that's all I want to talk about. I um, had asked the priest about it, and he didn't really believe in in, in it. So he kind of brushed me off, but there was another priest there, and he said, you do not, it's not a, he said, what you have is a demon, mm. and um, he said, I'm, he said, I'm afraid to deal with it because of his age, mm. different questions, and whatever, I, he gave, gave me reasons why he wouldn't, but he did tell me certain things that I could do, and I did them, Right. and it did leave it at one point. Actually, he left it several. Did someone invite it back in? And the last, um, I had gone to a psychic, and she told me what to do. Mm. She said, you got, she said, you're sleeping on the th in the third floor. She said, I, well, I had crucifix in every room, over every right. way. But she told me to put this crucifix that, when the light would shine through the window, it would shine onto the crucifix to have the Bible there. But the salt go around and put pray and told me what to say and put salt in, in mm. the corner and on the window sills and all. And I did all that stuff, and um, it left. It was gone. Mm. Well, then a few days later, my son John had these two friends who practically lived at my house. I fed them and they. <laughs> they, well, we have so many people in and out of that house, but um, Joe and Jeff pretty much lived at my house. Their mother had something wrong with her, I don't know, and the, the parents were divorced, and they were living on top of a, a studio, a karate studio. Anyway, they pretty much lived at my house. And the thing, um, I had gotten rid of it. 
And John was, my son John was, I think in the senior year of high school at the time. And Jeff, I heard Jeff, Jeff hollered up, he was outside and he said, Mrs. Murphy, is John home? Now I'm on the third floor and I really can't see who's at the door, but I know his voice. I mean, he's right. been in my house for the last five years or whatever. But if I look out, what I see is the roof over top of the porch. I said, he's not here right now, Jeff, but you can come in and his room and wait for him. Mrs. Murphy, is John home? I said, no, Jeff, he's not home, but you can come in his room and wait for him. Mrs. Murphy, is John home? I'm like, Jeff, come in and wait for him. And the door opened, I could hear him walking. I heard him walking up the steps to my son's room. I'm on the third floor. I heard him coming up to the third floor. There was a platform, he stopped at the third floor and he said, Clara. And I realized I had invited the demon back into my house. Oh, no. I was screaming out of there. I just got my car keys and I just left. I was just, I had invited it back in. It, uh, it would do that with voices. It would take different people, voices. And it would, I remember one, I, after my daughter died, my granddaughter, her daughter, came to live with me and I thought her father was going to also and we were putting an addition on like we didn't have enough room anyway um I had gone to a class a sewing class and I left a note for the fellows who were doing the work construction work like I say the door is always open anyway I mm -hmm. left a note saying I'm not home this is my if you need to call me you know this is where I'm at so I came home around three o'clock and they were still there I was like oh you know what's going on and whatever and they were like i said they said oh, i said something about just getting home and they were like what do you mean you just got home we heard you talking to your dog up in your room all day I'm like no i haven't been here all day but it would do that with different people it would do it would do different voice people's voices right but the thing that was another that was very scary was it knew our names mm -hmm. you know so I mean, it knew Jeff, it knew John, it knew me, it knew probably all of us. You know. It knew Natalie, because here's, um, here's this, you know, um, Natalie said once she moved back in when she was a teenager, I mean, going to high school, um, it would say like... That was my daughter, Laura's. Yeah, Laurie mm -hmm. died. Natalie is not Laurie's daughter. It would say like things like, she'd be in a room and she'd hear my mother saying, Nat, what you doing? Nat, what you doing? this or that and it would just be short com it wouldn't be like a conversation but my mother mm. wouldn't be there and right. it became a very interesting point and i think my mother had the answer it's sort of like when i was talking to natalie about this she goes you know if it really wanted to freak me out it should have spoken to me in the voice of my mother because that would have really mm. freaked me out and i then i'm sitting there wondering well why didn't it talk because it was a it was malevolent and mm -hmm. I think my mother had the best answer because I would talk to my siblings about it and say, try to get their opinion on this. And I think my mother had the best opinion is that it would have given it away if it spoke in my sister's voice, my dead sister's mm -hmm. voice, because mm -hmm. it wanted to engage us. You know, it wanted to engage in conversation. Mm -hmm. So it would it would do the voice of someone you knew could you know could be there. Right. And I think I think that mm -hmm. was it. I think it was just trying to you know engage her in conversation. But she had some very frightening experiences in that house, you know. Right. And so, sorry. So we've got this entity who started showing himself as a shadow form first initially, correct? Yeah. After after you had, you know, things missing, noises, which you could dismiss as being the kids because there were so many. So he started showing as a shadow. He mimicked people's voices. He got physical with you. Well, Natalie said it would spoon with her in her bed. Yeah. Yes, it yeah, did with yeah. me too. 
It did with yeah. me too. It probably did with all the women. I would say so. And Pat's no, it would feel yes. it was actually spoon with yes. you. My late brother, by the way, when I put out these um, blogs, I get contacted by people who knew my siblings, my late siblings. And somebody contacted me and said that my brother said he used to hear my mother talking up there and my grandma and his grandmother talking, saying things when when Uh they weren't there. My brother was having mental problems, but he said he could hear them. They would be saying how they were going to commit him. You know, and my mother was not there, and she would know. I would never have said that anyway. Yeah, no, no, I couldn't imagine. So he was hearing voices too, but it could have been his psychosis. But if he was the only one who ever heard a voice there, Mm. and I know you were making a point, but I I just want to jump on this voice thing. My father, who was always a skeptic, when we had our meetings about the house, Mm. he just looked at us like we were crazy. Right. But at the end of his life, he was he he was very Mm. ill. And my niece was living there, and my mother was still there, and my youngest brother. And he would walk in the middle of the night. He, he was sick. He was living, essentially living on the first floor of the house. He would walk all the way up to the third floor in the middle of the night to the hell room and have conversations with something up there. Uh, and no, my niece would try to sneak up to hear if like something was answering him. But she he would... He always heard her on the creaky steps and would say, Nah, what are you doing? Mm. You know, and so she never got to hear. But my father was a skeptic. And this was another one of these things in these interviews that I had never heard until I did these interviews. And I found that very disturbing, mm. you know, mm. that he, that he, he was doing He used that. to talk to it in the living room also, if he had the doors closed. You, you could try and you could never understand what it would say. It would respond to him, but you couldn't understand what it what was said, what was being said. Also, another thing that it that it did, and it did it two times that I know of, may have done it more than that. My son John lived, his bedroom was above our living room downstairs. And at one point we were downstairs in the living room with John and his friend Joe. And I don't remember if your father was there or not. I think it was a football game on and they were talking about football. And all of a sudden it sounded like every, all the furniture upstairs moved, mm-hmm. and then when you couldn't, when they went up, you couldn't get into the bedroom at all. Mm-hmm. Pushed against the door. They had to climb out on the. They had to go out of the roof and climb in the window and move to get the furniture to get the door open. Wow! So, 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 so you had five basic things, and you had it mimicking your voices. You saw it as a shadow figure. You saw it played mind games with you all it got physical with you all and you got poltergeist activity yes how did you cope oh and one time after we had the new kitchen put in i went down to the grocery store and i was going probably you know a half hour 45 minutes or whatever i came home it was an electric stove every burner Mm -hmm. on that stove was lit up as high turned up as high as it would go. Wow. And that brand new, I mean, if you put your hand on the next to the stove, the wood was so hot, it's amazing that it didn't burn. And there was a couple of times that it turned the stove on. One time I was up in my bedroom, I was work, I had worked for a while and I got uh, laid off or fired, I'm not sure. Anyway, I, I was given the opportunity to, to quit, which I did. <laughs> And uh, like. I was in my, well, I was either me or the fellow who I hired to work with me. And I figured he had a family. Right. So right. We worked for an advertising agency. Uh-huh. Every time we lost a um, client. Somebody had to go. Everybody had to leave. You know, somebody had to leave. Anyway, from my bedroom, I had a nice rocking chair in my bedroom. And I used to, I could look out my bedroom door. It would never stay closed anyway into the bathroom if that bathroom door was open, which normally if no one was in there, we would leave it open so you would know right. no one was in there. And I was reading a book and all of a sudden, all the water in the bathroom, I could hear the water running. I went in and both faucets were turned on that you had to actually turn when they weren't. Right. You know, I went back in my room and did it again. And then, Sean, do you remember when Debbie came down after Laura died? After my daughter died, my sister-in-law, Debbie, came down one day. And it was like two weeks after Laura died. 
And um, she said, I thought maybe you'd be lonely. She said, who's down here with you? Because somebody was always in my house. I said, nobody's mm -hmm. here. I said, it's, it's just, just me today. And she said, and then with that, we heard somebody walking across the floor and going to the bathroom. And she said, we're both looking up like this. And she said, you said nobody was here with you. I said, nobody is here with me. Do you want to go up and see who that is? She said, I think we should go shopping. I said, I do too. We just left. <laughs> but there was no one in the house with me. But no matter what floor you were on, you could hear footsteps. I think you could hear. I think you could hear me or hear us mm. and, and understand what we were saying. Yes, absolutely. I can, I can vouch for that completely, you know. I was lucky, I was very religious, and I prayed and prayed, and God kept it out of my bedroom. But there's always the dangers, right. particularly with curiosity, of inviting it back in, you know, breaking right. that wall of protection. I remember one time, nothing had happened in a while, at least to me, but stuff was always happening to somebody. I didn't realize it at the time. I was sitting mm -hmm. um, in my bedroom, the door was open, across the hall was the hell room, and I'm like, there's nothing here, because if it was here, it could turn on those lights, and it turned on the lights in the hell room. So it obviously heard me, and it responded. Mm -hmm. And you know, my sister talked like, um, and my niece both talked about how it was sort of like making offers to you. Now this didn't come in mm -hmm. any words or something, but I definitely got the feeling like, do you like that? I can mm -hmm. see what else mm -hmm. I can do. But at that time, I mean, I was like, I'm not going to communicate with it. I'm not going to give it, you know, and an more of a foothold in the right. But I used to hear footsteps. That's how it first manifests itself to me on the roof of, you know, because my, my um, bedroom was on the third floor. At first, I heard scurrying like squirrels or something, you know, which you could mm -hmm. explain. But then, like, yeah. human footsteps. And there's no way anyone could get on that roof. And, you know, that was a very high roof and a very dangerous roof to walk on. And, um, you know, and so that's, and, and the funny thing is, because it could definitely see me, because I would be in bed with my mm -hmm. eyes closed, and whether it was the scurrying or the footsteps, I would hear it, I'd be awake with my eyes, as soon as I opened my eyes, it would stop. Mm -hmm. And as soon as I closed my eyes again, it would continue. And it was enough that I could mm -hmm. see, I could sense where it was moving around, you know, around above me and all. So, but if I opened my eyes, it would stop. So it could definitely see me. It was definitely interacting with yeah. me, you know, as, you know, as it did with the light, you know. So it, it you know, because this is something I would constantly, in the interviews with my siblings and my mother and all, is try to discern in their deal, you know, in their actions with it, whether this was just a force or an intelligence whether they sense mm. the sense of personality with it. And also one thing I keep asking mm. everyone, because early on when we would discuss it a little bit, people were, I think some people thought it was like a human ghost. So I would ask, so right. I would constantly ask people, because I think my sister, my sister had seen it as in a female shape. Oh, so I would always, but doing this interviews, I always ask people whether they felt it was male or female. And most would people would say that instinctively they would think it was male, but they didn't ultimately, if they thought about it, it didn't seem to have a sex. They just felt that it was male because it was large. Right. But not because it was had male characteristics, but that it was large in the ground. Also, I think the things that it did, the way that it, it some of the stuff that it did yeah. seemed more yeah. masculine, that like a yes, female yes, would yes. not do that. Yeah. Yeah. So... It just seemed masculine, but I probably mm. did not have a gender. Which makes me think, also, too, I've asked them, and pretty much everyone's under the opinion that, you know, this thing was not human, mm -hmm. that it was never human. Now, my niece, Marion, who has apparently very gifted, you know, something I didn't realize until we did these interviews, mm -hmm. but she felt that there were also human spirits there, mm -hmm. maybe prisoners or something mm -hmm. of it in the house, but she thought that the entity... The, the main entity was very dominant, dominated anything in the house. So um, that was her opinion of that. She did something very interesting one time. She was going to art school, and um, one of her friends wanted to 
record the sound of someone walking up wooden steps, you know. And so she said, Grandma, can my, my friend and I come over and record, she make a re recording of her walking up to your third floor. And I was like, sure, go ahead, come on up. So when they got there, I thought, well, you know, they had a recorder. And uh, when they got there, I said, well, look, so I won't disturb you. I'm going to go down to the grocery store. So anyway, I left. And when I came back, she said, <laughs> when they put the recorder on, mm. they got voices. Marion. Yeah, I went to art school and my roommate wanted to do a sound project where she walked on wooden floors. She did sound files for it, and so I was like, well, I know a house that has that, but I also knew that when I went in there, I wasn't going to ask. I wasn't asking for anything. Like, I went in there and I was just like, I'm not here for anything. I'm just here to get some sound files and go walk around. But so we were walking on the floor. She was recording it, and you could hear. But then we could both hear this, like, shuffling kind of, like, sheets rustling around us. And it was it was a bad situation. We were like, okay, well, let's leave. We'll go listen first, though, to make sure we got all the sounds. As when we were listening back, it we have all sounds, the right sounds, like the people like us walking on the floor. There's... Like, just something else about it that felt like an actual thing coming through it, the sound. And it was just hard to describe because we both were looking at each other like, what? We turned it off. But there wasn't any other sound. It was just, it felt like, it's really hard to describe. And my niece, other niece, uh, uh, Natalie, did an EVP up in the hell room. She did that after yeah. Marion said. And, th and then I think they heard me too. And she's like, Grandma, the minute you left, it was the minute you left, you know. And Natalie, I, I used to have to drive her to school, which was quite a distance from our house. It was 25 wow. miles. I used to drive her to school in the morning, and she had to be there at 7.15 in the morning. So in the winter, you know, you get up, it's dark. So I kind of like, would lag in bed while she used the bathroom and whatever and got dressed and then I would get them. And the one morning Sean was there, um, she was in the other bedroom. I was in the big bedroom. She was in what was my son John's bedroom at one time. And uh, there was this banging on the door. Bang, 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 bang. I'm like, Natalie, Natalie, please stop that. And she's like, well, mom, it's not me doing that. And it was a, a short missile banging on the door to the third floor. Where yeah, this, Sean, is, this was, there, I believe, my you? last day living at the house. It was so scary. It was unbelievable. It was I mean, sort of like it's so goodbye long. to me. But there, my brother John and other people will tell you there were these other terrifying experiences. These bangings were rare that it was stuff that people experienced at once. After I had left, there was another big banging, and apparently it was banging on all of the doors on the um, on the second floor at one time. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's, and my brother will tell you it was absolutely terrifying. Yeah. And Natalie was still there. This was during the day. This was in the morning, and and apparently you were shouting to Natalie, "Don't open the door! Don't yeah. open the door!" Well, once she said it wasn't so, her, I was like, "Why is she doing that?" And she's like, "It's not me, Grandma. It's not me." And I'm like, "Don't open the door! Don't open the door!" <laughs> Didn't know. Oh, wow. So we did have some terrifying experiences in that. House. Yeah, and and it never scared you out of the house. That's what amazes me. You stay. Well, here. you know, people say that. Why didn't you move? You can't just pick up and move. I had when I moved into that house. There were five children. Mm -hmm. I was pregnant with the sixth child, mm -hmm. and um, my husband, number one, was never home. He, he didn't believe in any of that stuff to begin with. So, right. and where are you going to go? We borrowed money in order to yeah. put a down payment on that house. It isn't like, all right, well, we'll just leave, you know, and he yeah. wouldn't have left anyway. I mean, the house was actually, the house itself was a charming house. Mm. It's a beautiful, beautiful. house. Mm. I, I love that house, you know, the house itself. But yeah, I would never go back in there. Yeah, um, Sean was saying he was going to try and get um, at one point 
fact, at one point it was it was on on a the fellow that lived there after us didn't stay in there very long, and he was trying to renovate it. And the neighbors said he got real old real quick, and then he had some he had an aneurysm or something. My husband had an aneurysm in that house. He had an aneurysm mm -hmm. in that house, and then um, the house was on auction. Sean said he was going to buy it. I said, Sean, I will never visit you if you go there. Never. Yeah, my mother sold the house. I think it was for like, um, what was it, um, $298,000. And it went up for auction like a couple years later for $10,000. So um, wow. the auction price, it, it stopped at 100. But the main, I remember I told you those closets on the um, second floor mm -hmm. was the initial center of the haunting. Um, I thought he had been renovating the house Cause, and because the master bedroom, the walls were torn down to the slats and also torn out were those closets mm -hmm. between the master bedroom and the thing. Now, I thought he had just been renovating it and didn't finish, you know, which would explain also why the price was so low on mm -hmm. the master bedroom and those closets were torn out. But from what I had later discovered, talking to the neighbors who had, you know, knew him, is that he tore those wall those rooms had been renovated he tore them down right before he left he tore that th those walls down mm -hmm. so i don't know why i've reached out i've talked to that guy's daughter who never who was i said she's only been in that house twice and you know i i don't think i've put anything on the blog yet I, I haven't given up hope on actually speaking to them but about what happened but i will be talking to some other people who knew him on the record and, and talk about some of the talk about that because that was really kind of disturbing to me. It indicates to me um, that whatever was there was still there and playing on their minds as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't want to be too judgmental because I don't have the facts, but it seems behavior consistent with what we experienced. The reason that I sold it to those people was I thought it was just a couple, an older couple. And I thought maybe it wouldn't bother an older couple. I thought a lot of it had to do with there were so many young people that it was right. getting energy from there being so yeah. many younger people in the house. Yeah. And then I've come to find out, he was like, oh, my grandchildren are loved this. And I thought, oh, God, no, no children. Yeah, apparently the grand, some grandchildren. I went through the realtor and said, George, do I have to say this house is on it? And she said, not unless they ask. And I, every time, every house I looked at after that, I asked, when I went into the house, is this house haunted? Do you have any problems with ghosts? <laughs> Although, that was not a ghost. Mm. It was not a ghost. That was not. And I will say that when the house, went up, when the house, Marianne, when the house went up for auction, I went, you know, I was one of many people looking at the house before the auction. And I would tell people that I was a previous previous resident. They would ask me about it. And I would tell them all that this house is haunted. And they would all be like, oh, that's cool. And I'm like, no, it's not cool. This dangerously haunted. I used to say it's not Casper the Friendly Ghost in there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it was not Casper the Friendly Ghost. And I don't think I... I I know who lives there now. And um, I don't know him personally, but, you know, I know... I'm, you know, I know, have their information. I didn't speak to them. Uh, you know, I don't remember them at the auction. So I didn't speak to them. So um, I don't know. Wow. I'm certainly not going to reach out to them and ask them if they've had any experiences during the COVID lockdown. Oh, sure. you know? And we were talking with some people who were interested in trying to contact them and do some sort of activity at the house to see if they would be willing to let, you know, some investigators in. Mm -hmm. But that once the investigators read the interviews, they were like, mm -hmm. eh, we don't necessarily want to go in there unless we go in with like religious people. Mm -hmm. And also they were afraid that if it, whatever was in the house, if it wasn't active, they were they didn't want to trigger it while another right. family was living. There. Absolutely. And that, okay. and that is also why I write quite a bit about the house, but I had no time to give the actual address. Mm -hmm. It doesn't take a genius to figure out where it is, mm -hmm. you know. In fact, um, somebody reached out to me on Facebook and said, is the address of the house this address? And it was somebody I didn't know. And I'm like, 
how did, how did you figure it out? He goes, well, you gave enough to, I knew the neighborhood and I went on Google maps and I went up and down every street until I saw the house. Cause I had pictures of the house. Mm-hmm. So they had found it that way. But the, it, it, the address I give at 21 St. Helens Avenue is actually the real address of the house when the house was built. Right. They've subsequently renamed the street. I don't know when, sometime before 1927, when it sold the second time right. and they changed the number, the numerical numbers. You know, this Baltimore City has a sort of a pattern mm. in how they n- number streets and where they are. And um, and so they changed the number, they changed the address. But, um, you know, we have not talked to the current owners. Mm. I know people who know them now. I've asked around, but I know people who know them, you know, and um, I don't know if I will be talking because there is that danger. If to, But the exactly. more I've been talking to people, the more it seems to me that we didn't trigger it. No, no. When we went into the family, we didn't trigger this no, thing. No. And I think it was messing with the people after us. Mm. So my assumption is it's messing with the people that are there now. Mm. But mm. whether there was definitely an escalation in our house after contact, you know, after the Ouija board. That Ouija oh, board absolutely. And, and I actually suspect that when you use the Ouija board, it actually brought other spirits through as well. Yes, and we had yes. prayed. That's my test. We had prayed prior to that that you know no other spirits come through and all that stuff, but mm-hmm. it didn't seem like it. It mattered very much. But I want to say too, the fellow that bought the house after us, it was he and his wife. They worked in Washington. She worked in Washington D.C. And I believe he was in the process of retiring. I believe he had to work there also. Um, so. Um, I know she didn't live there very long and moved to Florida. Whether they separated, I don't know. Mm. I think they're still together. Yeah. Well, they're, is he still alive? Yes, they're both still alive. Okay. But I know she did not. They're very private. Yeah. I can't get through to them. Uh-huh. But I did I did talk to their daughter. She's read the blogs. Uh, okay. At least the first six or seven yeah, of them. So. I messed with your mind. Oh, you know, definitely. And mm-hmm. the way that it did it, as we've been saying, was that it, although there were six people, six, there were eight of us in that house, we didn't, it seemed like it was, each one of us had our own special little right thing with it that week. You didn't want to talk about it. Well, number one, is it just me? Am I making this up? Mm-hmm. You know, is it in my mind? Um, because I think too, one of my, I always said it wanted my soul mm. is what I always felt it wanted my soul. Right. And so I mean, you just don't go to your kids and say, "Hey, you have you uh, you know, there's something here that wants your soul." <laughs> you know, I mean, it's one of the nieces. I can't forget remember which one said that's what she felt too that it that it wanted her soul. Wow. One of them too. So you guys were were constantly living under a state of oppression and terror, actually. Definitely oppression, Mm -hmm. not always terror. Mm -hmm. Terror would be periodic. Right. But oppression was always there. I don't I I ever got a good night's sleep. (laughs) It was was a a rare thing to get a good night's sleep. Yeah. (laughs) Because um, it, it was like the witching hour, too, that would always wake of you. Of course, of course. And that's when things would get more active, yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So, Sean, um, I'm, I'm a bit hesitant to ask about your sister and brother because I know it's such a traumatic thing. Um, and I understand if you don't want to talk about it, no one. No, I'll talk about anything. Okay. Um, and Clara, um, I'm not trying to sensationalise this. I, I, I want to understand what events led up to their suicide and why do you think that it was the entity that caused it? Well, let me, let me, let me jump right. in. Um, neither of them died in the house. Right. My sister died at her house, which was probably about a mile away or a little less than a mile away. Um, my brother died in, and she shot herself in the basement mm-hmm. of her house. And my brother died in Michigan, in Flint, Michigan. He was in a motel and he tried to hang himself in the motel, didn't succeed, and apparently hung himself in a workplace uh-huh. next door in very public view. 
because I didn't know we had relatives in Michigan when I did the family tree. And um, I was talking to them and they didn't know me and I didn't know them. And then I mentioned how my brother died there. And they're like, yeah, I remember that. It was in the news, oh, you know, wow. so apparently he hung himself in front of rush hour traffic. So it was pretty, pretty. And I was like, I'm going to do, I'm going to do the research on the desk, mm-hmm. but it's like, mm-hmm. I don't want to read. I don't want to get the police. Rep- read I want to interrupt Sean too with the, with Laura's death. Um, my uncle, we called him Uncle Buzzy. He was in Second World War, and he took um, a Luger off of a German soldier that he killed. And at one point in t- after he died, his brother, they were two bachelor brothers, said to my daughter's husband, here, take this gun, and or do you want this gun? And I said, don't give him that gun. If you give him that gun, somebody in that house will kill himself with it. And it end, and he took it and it ended up, it was my daughter who shot herself with it. Mm-hmm. And the funny thing was, I I know she could, she had difficulty pulling that trigger. She could never pull the trigger on it uh, because- Well, I don't think she could cock it. Right. Took it, uh, right. They took it down to the shore and were trying to, he was trying to teach her how to use it and she couldn't use it anyway. Anyway. But there's another factor too that um, before her death, there was um, a guy in Hamilton called the Touching Bandit. Yeah. And he would like, he was like a housebreaker and would touch the women while they were sleeping. Mm-hmm. And um, the night, and there was a night where he broke into my sister's house. My sister, he didn't touch her because she was sleeping on the sofa and sort of woke up and then he just proceeded through the house. But he had been in three other houses that same night. So when she called, the police were there immediately because they they were on his trail. And um, after, um, so that's why she wanted to learn how to use the gun. Right. See, her husband worked night work. He got off around midnight. He worked Mm. third, second shift or third shift. I guess I have a second shift. And um, she kind of fell asleep. She would wait up for him on the sofa and she would doze off right. watching television. And she said, I thought at first, she thought at first it was her husband who came home and put his head on her lap. And then mm-hmm. when she looked, it was yeah. money who should yeah. Oh. yeah. So she screamed, Natalie, lock your door. And she- The guy took off. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now here's something, here's something weird. So they eventually catch this guy and it's time for the trial. And they contact, you know, my brother-in-law about my sister. They wanted to talk to her to be a witness. And um, cause they were, there were three people that night, three women. And he's like, she died. And how she, what do you mean she died? She killed herself. One of the other women that that guy's head was in that house also killed herself. Oh. So of the three women, two or two took their own lives before they caught this guy and brought him to trial. So, but I'm not thinking that like, when I'm talking about whether, whether, whether this thing influenced us to kill people, to kill ourselves. I can only look at, I had a suicide attempt in that house too, Mm -hmm. you know, which was, I had sort of this emotional, spiritual collapse. There was a breakup with a girlfriend. Mm -hmm. I write about it in my first book. And the funny thing is I never connected that with the entity in the house because at that time I wasn't aware of it. Right, of course. But as I look at the behavior and I'm examining things, I'm like, and when I was writing my book and I got to my suicide attempt, I was just objectively looking at my life at the time and um, it wasn't that dark. Mm -hmm. You know, when I... I mean, I would eventually break up with this girl, but we were actually on the upswing at the time right. that I did this. And um, and I'm thinking, you know, I couldn't explain why I was in the emotional state I was in. Mm-hmm. And I really think that it was just that mm-hmm. the influence of this thing. And so Absolutely. I don't think I don't think this thing went to my sister's house and helped her pull the trigger. Yeah. But what I I think it left in a lot of us that it took years to get rid of is this dark oppressiveness mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that you know that 
you know, we were prisoners of it. And, and you know, and I, I always call, you know, I think I mentioned in one thing, if I was going to call this book anything, if I were to write a book about it, and as I said, I don't, I don't like the ending. I don't think I will. I would call it The Haunting of 21 St. Helens Avenue, you know, the shadow in living, you know, living in the shadow of the beast, because in many ways we continued to, you know, even after we left, we continued to live, yeah. you know, in this thing's shadow. Mm. But, so you know. even it sounds like we had, we had a happy house, didn't we, Sean? Uh, as a family? Well, yeah. You know, we all got along. Our father would, never came home, but um, which was probably for the best. But I mean, they, we all, we were a good family, you know. Mm. Um, we had fun, we did our thing. Yeah, we, we had fun, we did, you know. I had an idyllic childhood. You know, so um, I can't complain. Yeah, right. And obviously you were a very strong family unit because you stayed together. And despite all of this, despite the best efforts of these entities, that's, that's got to say something about you holding the family together, Clara, and, and, and the way you brought up your children. And as for your son and your daughter, you know, PTSD is not uncommon after experiences like this. And it could have been that that guy that broke him was just enough to trigger yeah. triggered all for her again, yeah. and it brought all those experiences back to her mind. Yeah. Well, I know Mark had um, mental problems. Mark was in yeah. and out of, you know. He, so it's funny because Mark was the quietest of all. Mm. He was the best baby. <laughs> the best, you know. He was, it's kind of a shock that he ended up with, um, I don't know if he was ever strictly diagnosed or not as, he ended up in the- We have these HIPAA laws yeah. in this country that prevent doctors from telling people what's wrong with, you know, like family members. Oh, really? So we never got my brother's diagnosis. Oh, what? When he was good, he was very, very good. And when he went crazy, he was just, not to call up the brothers and say it's time for Mark to take a ride again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They'd come down and tackle him and we'd take him down to the psych ward. I know a couple times he asked me to take him and I'd take him down, you know, he, Mom, I'm going out again. Okay. Uh, well, you know, at least he was cognizant enough to recognize when he was going into a state where he needed help. So that's yeah. a really positive thing, Claire. Yeah, he heard a lot of voices and whatever too mm -hmm. my mother can back me up on this but if you were to read my book chapel street the hero talks with his dead brother and the br dead brother lenny is very much based on um mark. my brother mark mm -hmm. and the history of mental illness that the brother lenny went through and his attitudes about mental illness and hospitals and why you get off your meds and things like that you know, it's um, all stuff my brother told me. Uh -huh. Would you say Lenny is lot like Lenny Mark? Lenny is Mark. I mean, uh, you know, <laughs> Lenny is Mark. He, he really captured him. Wow. And, but I will say one thing. The mother in that book is not based on my mother. <laughs> Sean usually, She's based on mother Sean usually kills husband. the mother off in the first chapter. <laughs> <laughs> As a result of all of these experiences and, and the pain and the trauma that these have caused you, how do you feel now, Clara, when you look back on this and Sean? How, how, how do you feel? Well, hindsight's twenty twenty. You know, I don't know that I would have done anything different because mm. that's where I was mm. mentally, physically, and so I don't know. I mean, yeah, I would like everything be different. I would like never to have lived in that house if I, if I had known what was going to happen. Um, but life goes on and you just have to live it as, take it as it comes, you know, right. make the best of it. Yeah, It's hard it's losing it's children because it's not supposed to be that way. And especially in the, in the, the way that they went, and it make I don't like to think about it because um, I think about the last. You, you concentrate on the end. Yes. Yes. 
and not all a good mm -hmm. time to jag, you know. Yeah. I usually try, if I start thinking about that part, I usually try and think about something else because I don't want to remember them yes. in their agony. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm sure they both went through agony. Yeah. And that's not the way that um, they lived. And that's not the way I want to remember them. So. And that's not how they would want you to remember them either. I can tell well, you I that. I wonder, what would happen if they, you know, I can see these shows where these people come back from the dead. I don't know. I don't, I, I really do. I really think that was their time to go. And I yeah. think it was to teach a lesson. You know, um, my, my granddaughter grew up a different life than she would have had yeah. had her mother lived. And she's a very strong person, mm -hmm. you know, mentally. Don't you think so, Sean? Yeah, and she's got two kids. She's very happy. Yeah, she's and doing she's her doing her nursing training. How wonderful is that? How wonderful yeah, is that? Yeah. yeah, so, I mean, it, it obviously had an effect. If you look at my book, you'll see it's a main, it's, I feel guilt, you know, Laurie was like a shock. It was a shot in the Absolutely. dark when she, you know, it was a total surprise. Yeah. Later, you can look back and you can think of some things, but it's sort of like there wasn't enough warning that mm. you could have ever mm. done anything. And if you look at my book, it's definitely, and the relationship between the, the main character, Rick, and his dead brother, Lenny, you know, I, I, I am dealing with, you know, and one of the reasons I'm doing these blogs and all, it's dealing with some guilt in the sense that mm. there may have been a spiritual aspect. You know, Mark, we just sort of, Mark was a train going down the track. Yeah. You know, I don't think any of us suspected that, you know, he was going to live to be 90. Yeah. You know, I mean, because when he was going mad, he was going mad. Mm. And, um, yeah. but, you know, I feel like there was, if there was a spiritual aspect of this that we missed, something related to the entity or something like that, that maybe we could have, you know, prayed about or mm -hmm. tried to exercise. I, I, and I, I feel that we didn't look into that. I have, I've told this to Sean before, but before my daughter died, I was taking a shower one day. I, twice I have seen my guardian angel, spirit guide, whatever mm -hmm. you Whatever you want to refer to it as. And it always comes to me before people die. Right. That are very close to me. Right. One was my grandmother, who pretty much raised me. And I was taking a shower, and um, this was a month or so before my daughter died. I did not see it, but it said to me, and I know its voice. Right. And it said to me, one of your children is going to die within the month. Oh. And I said, don't tell me. I don't want to know. And then it said, and it's not the only one. Oh, Claire. So in a way, I had a preparation. But the shock of it, I thought it would be Mark. And me. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think. And you thought. Laura would have been Laura would have been the last one, you know. How can you ever prepare yourself for something like that? You just can't. You just can't. Well, that's why I say I think it was their time to go. Yeah. Otherwise, how would I have known? Why would Absolutely. my mother tell me? Absolutely. That? Absolutely. And that's what I tell. That's what I tell to my people who who are dealing with suicides look don't focus on how they went it was their time to go or if they hadn't gone that way they would have gone in some other manner in fact there was a she, laura was there was a bad ice storm right before she died a horrible ice storm and she had told me one of the way she had just gotten a job selling clothing in this store and she saw the other girl who had started stealing. Right. She said, should I tell the boss? I said, yes, I think you should. And she did. And the cops came. And Laura left and was driving. And it was this ice on the road. And her car went. I think maybe even that was a suicide attempt, Sean. Do you think so? And I think that was went off the beltway and wow. went up into the, uh, this tree and got stuck in this tree. 
the car was like all bent up and all. And uh, it should have been a fatal accident. Yes, yeah, it wasn't. Died. She should have died then. And wow. then when she went home, her husband started ragging about, well, he didn't have car insurance and this and that because you're just taking the, the whatever insurance off of the car. And um, that's when she went down and shot herself. Oh. It was Valentine's Day. It was Valentine's oh. Day. He bought her a dozen red roses, which ended up on her coffin. Oh, that's so sad. Oh, I'm so sorry. Oh, honestly, my heart just breaks. As a mum, I, I just... Well, we have lessons we have to learn. I mean... Great, great. You're I right. Hear, I think at some point, I'm a believer that, um, yeah, it might not be my first time around in this game, you know, and... I believe that you, you say you will it. I remember when I was growing up in Catholic schools and the nuns would say, when somebody, someone had a serious problem and they were led into this room and there were all these different crosses on the wall and you could pick, choose one. And they ended up always picking the one that, that was my cross to bear is, you mm -hmm. know, I mean, we all have crosses and you have mm. to deal with it, you know. So uh, I think I dealt with it well. I mean, I, it, I took, uh, it took me like two weeks. I stayed in bed and then one morning I just said, are you going to get up and live or are you just going to lay here and die? And I decided I was going to get up and live. Good for you, Clara. Good for you. Yeah. That's that's really. Mark died. He was out in in uh, Flint, Michigan, and it was a hurricane here, so it took us a long time to get his body back and and all that stuff. But Mark, we we kind of ex Mark, like Sean say, he was a train. We, we knew. Yeah. Him. Yeah. Um, yeah. Too. And, and sorry, it wasn't a shock. I mean, it was a shock. Mm. When, but um, at the same time, you kind of half expected it to happen, you know. At least you did have that bit of preparation, so it, it yeah. mitigated the shock a little bit. And that was incredibly kind of your guide to come and tell you that. Yeah. So it wasn't uh -huh. such a, yeah. So you're right. It was the time to go. Or he <laughs> wouldn't have come and said anything to you. Absolutely correct. And Sean, how did you deal with that? How did you cope? Well, I will say, and um, it's funny because I was mentioning this to my sister like two days ago, because when we were talking about coming on this podcast, how um, when my brother, uh, when Laurie died, somebody suggested we see a grief counselor. Mm -hmm. Do you remember this, Mom? Yeah. And all men, you know, my brothers, my father, the two, my two brothers-in-law, and some of my uncles, they all went out. We went out to this grief counselor, and he's and he's like, "So I just want you to talk about your feelings." I didn't know you went to and grief counselor. Hour long section, and not a person, not one of us, said a single word. Oh wow! You don't remember? You don't remember that? You brought? You weren't there, but hey, I don't know if you. I don't know who recommended we go out there, but we, we everyone made the effort to go out, but not anyone said anything. You know. Um, but you know, it was it was it was a shock. I will say I've never gotten over it. If you look at the um, my personal writings, you know, I've written a lot of commission screenplays and all. And um, uh, you know, you will see the the theme on the things I'm writing for myself. You'll see this the uh, theme of suicide quite a bit. Right. You know, and even my next book, which will be lighthearted, some more lighthearted than my first two. And somebody said, well, what it's about? And I said, well, it's about death and a guy working a mausoleum and suicide. You know, all my, all my, Favorite. you know, but hopefully it'll be funnier. All my familiar themes, you know, and plus I had nearly killed myself. So right. I deal with this. In a sense, Chapel Street, the fictional book, really kind of deals with my feelings about my brother, Mark. Right. And um, the last part of um, my book, The Promise or the Pros and Cons of Talking with God, my memoir, it goes from essentially my suicide attempt through my sister's death and right. um, how I dealt with that. So in a sense, my first book dealt with my sister's um, attempt. And, um, and um, 
you know, and the effect. And I think I've had a, a rare perspective that I've looked at suicide from both sides. Mm-hmm. You know, I'll send you my first book too. I already sent you, the, you know, Chapel Street. You should already have it. <laughs> and <laughs> while you were talking to my mother, I sent it. So I'll send you the first one too. And the funny thing is, is that I had mentioned earlier that my sibling, my the females in my family, my mother, my sisters, at least my sister Jeannie, my nieces, I think all of them, to some degree had some sort of power of clairvoyance or right. um, mm-hmm. empathy to like that. Mm-hmm. And if you read my book, I had a similar thing. Mm-hmm. I would receive what you'd call words of knowledge, mm-hmm. you know, prophecies, not like world prophecies, but things in my life, mm-hmm. you know, and I was always ahead of the game. And it's funny that I never associated that with it anything paranormal for me it was strictly religious Mm. but since i was experiencing some of the same things that my mother and my sister and my nieces experienced it but i looked at it from you know but i had a different worldview of looking at it right so these are all things that are i'm looking at now in a different way Mm. but um you know i you know these you know sometimes i felt sorry for mark because Laurie so destroyed the family when she died. Mm. And Mark was like an afterthought. Wouldn't you say that to a yes. degree, Mom? I mean, like, yeah. You know, Laurie was, you know. Laurie was, was a complete shock. Laurie was, you know, was, yeah. To, you know, I don't think anyone, you know, I mean, not just our immediate family. I mean, yeah. You know, everyone in, in the circle was shocked, you know, and the wider family and everything, uh, shocked about the her death and then Mark people were sad about that but it's sort of like you know um you know Mark well you know Mark died well I'm sorry to hear that you know but Laura when Laurie died it was yeah. it was totally stunning mm-hmm. and I really felt bad when I finished my first book that I really didn't talk about Mark's death but in the narrative um, flow of my first book my memoir you know Laurie's death loomed large in it you know it because there was a resolution of another relationship the central relationship in my book right. happened at my sister's funeral uh-huh. and so essentially then i just, could just jump forward i missed mark so writing about chapel street gave me an opportunity to kind of talk about my brother mark and you know in a fictional way yeah but yeah it was a way that was very emotionally relevant to yeah, me. and i think yeah. our religion we had um i think our I look at death in a different perspective, I think, a lot of times because of my religion. Right. I, mean, I don't think death is the end. No. You know? mm. uh, so, even, you know, and I know I'll see her again, and, you know, I'll see Mark again, and, and my dogs. <laughs> <laughs> I take care of my dog. Well, you know what, Claire, on a lighter note, I um, in my last episode that's currently that was currently released when I'm doing you. It's called Selling Dead People's Things. I interviewed this wonderful, wonderful chap in Chicago. And as we, he had the screen behind him, and I could see um, at the side, at the base of the screen, I could see the back of the room, you know, like there was a gap. And we, we were just about finished that, our interview, and I saw this dog go past in this tail wig, and I said, oh, what sort of dog do you have? And he said, dog. And I said, yeah, I just saw a dog go past, clear as, clear as. And he said, I don't have a dog. And I said, but I just saw a dog, a tan-colored dog with a fluffy tail. He says, oh, he says, oh, my God, that's Snookums. It was his dog that had died. Yeah. So just so you know, your animals are still around you. They still love you. Know, you. People used to see a cat in my house. Remember, Sean? Yeah, other people saw a cat too. We never had a cat. And we never had. Cats. I'm not talking about that big dangerous they saw a cat on the cat. third floor. Not my, not the horrible cat. That you know what I was going to mention that before about that, but shadow people can change shape, and it's not uncommon for them to appear as animals. Yeah. So these are these are things like once we're we finish with everyone's testimony, all the people who've lived in the house. You know, I'm going to, like, seek out people to, like, try to, like, put the pieces together yeah. and explain it, <clears throat> you know, so it'll, it'll be interesting to see. And I'm glad we have your insight. And hopefully, you know, I know this is a very popular podcast. By the way, 
you know, I, I do a movie podcast called Yippie Kaye Mother Podcast. Ah. Like, and um, where we, a couple of us talk about movies, kind of a fun podcast. And they would kill me if I didn't mention it. No, absolutely. But, um, I, I forgot, um, you know, I, I would say your podcast is more popular than ours. Oh, so I'm hoping that maybe we'll <laughs> um, get the attention of some people here who might be able to help us. Um, put the pieces together once the research is done but you know COVID I was hoping to have everything done by now but I like to do the interviews in person I do usually do them at my mother's house so she can throw in some questions too and um so you know I'm I'm behind way behind I'm a year behind on where I hope to be with actually researching the actual haunting so um but afterwards I'm really hoping to get you know some expert opinions so um, people won't make the same mistakes we did. I think the key is to just get out. Yeah. <laughs> if you can, if you can, in situations like that with elementals, you can't yeah. remove them. They were there before we were. They're going to be there after we're gone. The best in that situation, if it's possible at all, is to move. Right. Um, but obviously it's not always possible, you know, because you sink your life savings and you know you've got bills and stuff, and it's yeah, just I not really realized after a time that it was something that had been there mm. prior to us, uh, mm. prior to the house being there. I think, right? You know, it had yeah. something. I think there was a portal there because I think different things came in at different times. Oh, you know? a, a lot of them, ca- I bet. I'll bet, I'll bet your bottom dollars that when that Ouija board is played, that it was never closed. Yeah, probably not. Mm. Uh, yeah. Other people have used the word portal describing, I think, other people I've interviewed saying that they felt this was a portal. Mm, mm, mm. That house is a portal. Mm. So. Yeah. And, and having the Ouija board opens the portal even more. Yeah. So yeah. A lot of other portal. things happen that off the top of our head, you know, <clears throat> I just can't remember. And a lot of things happen to other people. Like if we were saying, some things happened to my son, John, uh, that didn't happen to me. My brushes right. would disappear, but he would leave his room to go to the bathroom and come back and his papers would be scattered all over the floor or different things would, I mean, a lot of things happen, you know, and the furniture moved around in this room. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. People would hear the furniture more, move more than they would see it. Mm-hmm. I remember another incident that they talked about was um, John was living in the basement at that time. He sort of had like, a, my brother Mark built an apartment in the basement with a separate entrance. And at one time, not only I think Nat, only Natalie and my mother were living upstairs on the second floor. They heard the furniture moving on the first floor. And they went up to the stairs and were like, John, what are you doing? And John heard the first floor and furniture moving from the basement. And um, he's like, I'm not doing anything. And they went down and nothing was moved. Mm. But it's like my nieces always say, and as I heard, it's like, no matter what floor you were on, you could always expect to hear footsteps, even if you're on the third floor, mm-hmm. footsteps above you. Mm. You know, there was always some sort of sense of, you know, move, not always, but it was not uncommon to always to hear movement of certain sorts. Mm -hmm. People said they heard the furniture moving in my bed. When I left that third floor rear bedroom, nobody else lived in that room. And um, my nieces said they used to hear the furniture moving in there when there was no furniture in that room. Wow. So I get the feeling, Sean, that this project of yours actually is going to go on for a fair while. Um, collating, I, I, I kind of feel like when the time is right, it's going to snowball a little bit and you'll get not only people from your home, but people from around your home who have had experiences in their places around your home that they'll contact you as well. So I actually feel that you're creating a bit of a monster here for yourself. It's going to get quite wow. big. And have you written a screenplay yet? Well, I have a screenplay for Chapel Street. Mm. There's already been some interest in the a movie version of it. I really can't talk about it now, course, but there is course. there's interest in it. But you know, nothing's going to happen now. Co- I have another film in pre-production where apparently the money's in place, and but with COVID, nothing's happening. Yeah, you know, it's sort of like 
you know, I'm actually writing a blog about writing a query letter for the Chapel Street movie because it's like, <laughs> you know, hey, I got there are people interested, so I'm not really, you know, thinking of actively querying it. But you always think about what to say, and um, there's no point sending it out now anyway because I don't think for the next couple months, you know, people aren't going to be really putting it out. There is stuff happening. There are people shooting movies and yeah. shooting TV shows, but there's so many restrictions that, you know, can you let my listeners know where they can reach you? Yes, the best way to reach me, you can reach me all over. I'm very active on social media. I am at Sean Paul Murphy on Twitter. I think that's also my handle. It's Sean, S-E-A-N, Paul Murphy. That's also my Instagram, Twitter, my Instagram um, tag, and I'm also... On Facebook, I'm strangely Sean Paul Murphy. I think there's only two Sean who use the full names on Facebook. I'm the fat one. And um, where else am I? Those are my main things are Facebook, um, Facebook, um, Instagram, and Twitter. And also, you know, my blog, I have a blog called Sean Paul Murphyville, um, blog at dot blogspot.com but if you just type google into google sean paul murphyville you will get it it's all things sean paul murphy you know probably too much sean paul murphy for most people but um and if you're getting there you can look to the search engine for um you know put in 21 saint helens <laughs> 21 saint helens and you'll get these stories about um i link to them a lot usually when i talk about chapel street I'll say on the blog, I'll have the things underneath, read about the haunting that inspired the book, and I'll have the blogs, you know, the um, links to the um, blogs about the actual haunting underneath of it. It's just been absolutely wonderful talking to you. I've really, really been quite moved by your stories, and I've enjoyed listening to your experiences. Thank you so very much for your time today. I've really loved having you and thank you for being so brave and sharing your pain. Thank you. Thank you for having us. I really appreciate it. Be sure and join us next episode when I continue this family's journey in talking with Natalia and Sean about Nat's experience in this terrifying home that she moved into after her mother Laura's death. And just a reminder, as I mentioned last season, these two episodes were recorded on my old iMac before it died on me, so there is discrepancy in parts of the audio with some parts of the episode that were recorded after the interviews were completed, and as I was stitching this episode together. If you enjoyed this episode, then please leave a positive rating and don't be shy to leave a written review on your chosen podcasting platform or on the podcast Facebook page, Walking the Shadowlands, of course. So you don't miss out on any episode, make sure you subscribe on your favourite podcasting platform. This Thanks podcast is available episode. on all Can't three podcasting you. platforms and iHeartRadio as well. Also, if you have Alexa, simply say these four words, Open Walking the Shadowlands, and Alexa will play our latest episode for you. If you don't have a smartphone, then you can listen to the episodes from the podcast website, www.walkingtheshadowlands.com. For those hearing impaired, there is a full written transcript of each episode on the website, so you don't miss out at all. Tell your friends, tell your family, tell your workmates about our show. Encourage them to listen and to subscribe also. The more, the merrier.